start in about one minute. Thank you. Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Promoting Resilience in Families During COVID. Our presenters today are Dr. Carol Weitzman and Allison Platt. Dr. Weitzman is a developmental behavioral pediatrician and the co-director of the Autism Spectrum Center at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard School of Medicine. She is a professor emeritus of pediatrics at the Yale School of Medicine. Nationally, she is the immediate past president of the Society for Developmental Behavioral Pediatrics, the immediate past chair of the American Academy of Pediatrics, AAP, section of developmental behavioral pediatrics, and a member of the American Board of Pediatrics Developmental Behavioral Pediatrics Subboard. Dr. Weitzman authored the AAP Interim Guidance on Porting the Emotional and Behavioral Health Needs of Children, Adolescents, and Families During the COVID-19 Pandemic. Allison Platt is the parent of Noah, an 18-year-old with autism, accompanying intellectual disabilities, Tourette's, and anxiety. Allison's family consists of Allison, her husband, and their two children, currently ages 18 and 20. I'm Kristen Dahl. My preferred pronouns are she, her. I'm a middle-aged white female with long blonde hair. I'm wearing a black shirt and tortoise shell glasses. I have a navy background with the MHDD logo. On behalf of the Mental Health and Developmental Disabilities National Training Center, I would like to thank you for taking the time to be here today. Please visit our social media and website, mhddcenter.org for resources related to mental health and developmental disabilities. If you are joining us on Zoom, the controls are located at the bottom bar of your Zoom window. Please use the chat box if you have any comments or technical issues, and we will do our best to assist you. Please use the Q&A to submit questions for our presenters. We will read your questions as time allows throughout the presentation or during the optional question and answer time from 3 o'clock to 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. There is a hand raising feature you can use if you need assistance from the MHDD team. Other than those presenting the webinar, everyone is muted and camera access is turned off. This webinar is being live captioned. You can turn on captions in the Zoom window by clicking the CC button on the menu and selecting Show Subtitles. You can also change the size of the caption text by selecting Show Subtitles. ASL interpreting services are being provided by Central Kentucky Interpreter Referral. The webinar is also being broadcast live on YouTube. If you are joining us on YouTube, please add your questions and comments to the live chat on the right hand side of your screen. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the MHDD YouTube channel and the MHDD website. We will be sending out an email following the webinar with an evaluation. We ask you to complete the evaluation so we can improve future webinars. The email will also include instructions on how to receive continuing education credits. Please hold the date for our next webinar, which will be held May 10th at 2 o'clock p.m. We will have a panel of storytellers with lived experience. Once again, thank you for being here, and I will turn it over to our presenters. Thank you, Kristen. Our son Noah was 16 years old in 2020 and had been attending the same special education school since first grade. He's a delightful individual who has a history of challenging behaviors such as sound sensitivity, property destruction, self-interest behavior, and aggression. He is really loved by everyone who has the blessing of getting to know him. He was in the middle of a transition to a new ABA therapist at school when the news came that we would have a closing for two weeks, which turned into months. 
We called this period coronation as it seemed like a long but strange vacation. And I wanted Noah to know that he would be returning to school. Before I address the impacts from my perspective, I thought I would share Noah's thought about that time period. On Sunday night, I asked him, what did you think about coronation? And he quickly answered and emphatically, stupid, bad, I hate coronation. I asked why? And he quickly answered with equal passion, because I hate virtual. And I think we all can kind of relate to that at different times. When a few weeks, once it was returned, determined that our state was gonna be closed indefinitely, NOAA school developed a virtual program. This consisted of five to seven 30 minute sessions a day, which were led by a special education teacher, social skills, speech, OT, physical therapy, and a special education instructor. The schedule was helpful in filling our days and keeping some sense of learning in place. It was also as of overnight, I became Noah's one-to-one -one instructor, filling in the time with more learning and breaks from work. It is very fortunate that I was so involved with this programming throughout his life that I had at least some skills to help support him. But it was a time filled with behavior management, skill support, virtual meetings, and very few breaks for me. In the beginning, Noah reacted remarkably well. He was pretty flexible. It was novel and he probably thought it was interesting. He was seeing his teachers whom he missed. And then it wasn't okay anymore. And his anxiety about being home and away from his school routine grew. I was given the job of taking one minute interval data on his perseverations during different parts of the day. At its worst, it was 29 out of 30 minutes. Actually, multiple utterances per minute. It was pervasive. When he finally put a chair through the window in his frustration and anxiety, Dr. Weitzman was there to help advise and make a medication adjustment. She identified the need for a 10 count system for times when writing down his perseverative thought one time did not help. Every time the governor would announce the next date for considering how things were going, we would continue a calendar on the wall, which we would cross off the days waiting for freedom. The medication adjustment and the increased use of visuals and systems to manage perseverative thoughts really were lifesavers for handling his anxiety. The state closure and restrictions impacted the structure and the learning of NOAA's school community and it impacted our home programming. NOAA's behavior in the summer of 2019 had produced a very intense behavioral episode in the community which despite my advocacy that it was an outlier, had landed him an extremely restrictive data system for increasing his community exposure with the agency. By March, 2020, he was pretty darn close to having met all the benchmarks to being in the community with reduced support, which would mean just one parent and one agency team member. Prior to that, we had two agency team members and myself. And then all the outings had to stop. The agency would not be able to come out, but eventually offered virtual. So on top of school virtual, we eventually got agency virtual. We cut those hours because it seemed like too much to ask of Noah to have five to seven sessions with school and then a two hour session with the people from the home program. After all, we were already home. This was a reduction in support. As things opened up a little bit, my husband and I recognized the impact this was having on Noah's community needs. So when the Home Depot opened, John tried to get him in there with some success. Unfortunately, a customer wearing a mask was yelling at an employee, which made this a place no one no longer wanted to go, as well as creating an overgeneralization of people in masks being mean. But still, here's Noah, who needs community experience, vocational experience, my husband began taking Noah out to his very preferred superior rental store, hedging our bets he would be safe due to his love of the staff in the store. For the first three or four weeks, Noah was leery of the mask covered public and he refused to go in the store. When he finally did, a kind store employee knowing the story gave him a courage coin and praised Noah for his bravery in coming in and wearing his mask. We are all very proud of him. Still, our agency was incredibly slow to take any chances coming to the home. So at Dr. Weizman's advisement, I reached out to DDS to see if we could get some funding for programming personal supports for home. 
but it was challenging finding the right staff for NOAA. We were lucky to have connected with a former school one-to-one. -one. The teacher had completed his training with NOAA before coronation, but our other recommended person did not seem to understand NOAA's clues that things were not going well. One particular evening, that member went home and Noah was frustrated about their time together. But he didn't share that until after his agitation had led to throwing three chairs into the window. And that was the end of that team member, a nice person, but really didn't understand how to handle Noah. Seeing the challenge of this and hoping the agency would soon come back out, we started adding back time. Once they were in the home, they wouldn't go in the community with clients. When we first returned to in-person school, students weren't able to go into the community. Fear of the virus, the non-vaccinated population, the van won't provide enough social distance, placements won't let the students back yet. Many, many reasons, all frustrating. I asked the director, if I find a place for vocational experience, drive him so that the staff could go in their own car, would this be allowed? And the answer was eventually yes. And now once a week, I pick up my son early from school and meet a staff at our church so he can clean. I know all of the parents attending today and probably all of the rest of you can relate to how hard we try to learn all we can about our child's challenges and advocate to the best of our abilities to get their needs met, to have all of that hard work, not the least of which is the hard work that our child has been putting into making progress on their areas of concern and have it just stop. And all the support, no matter how sufficient or possibly not quite enough, it just stops. And that includes for many people, their family support because their family couldn't come to help. It was a time when there wasn't help and I felt very much on my own. And all I could see was valuable time slipping away. And yet, I know I am blessed. I am not single parenting. Our school really put together a great program. My husband knows computers, so I had help with any technical issues. Noah has effective, positive support from Dr. Weitzman. That support was not true for everyone. A fellow parent called me in the early months asking if I was okay with what was happening. She was going to the state level to complain about the impact of the restrictions on our child's access to education. I wasn't really okay with it either, but given the circumstances we were all dealt, I did believe the school was really doing its best. However, she had a child that would not sit at the computer for instruction, pretty much not at all. And her child was very challenging behaviorally. And I am sure she felt time was just slipping away, critical time to increase her child's behavioral competencies, self-help abilities, just gone. And I am sure she was just exhausted, no break for her. I don't know if any of these situations resonated with you. Everyone is so very individual, but I hope this provided some insight into how one family, my family, made it through so far. And I thank you for your time in listening to me today. Thank you so much, Allison, for that, for, for telling your story and telling Noah's story. So I will jump in now. And first of all, let me just say thank you so much for that really very moving, very real depiction um, of what it was like to live through COVID. And I just have to say like, boy, you know, working with families like yours and with Noah kind of are just so, are such a true privilege for me and a source of incredible um, inspiration and especially getting to know someone like Noah who is, always an amazing young man to be around. Um, I would like to also just thank the uh, Mental Health and Developmental Disabilities National Training Center for inviting me today. And it's just, it's, it's really nice to see all the hellos from all around the country. All right, I'm gonna share my screen now and uh, get started with my talk. Can you all see that now? Is everybody able to see my screen and hopefully? Yes, all right. I can. Perfect. So I'm going to get started. We're going to spend time today talking about promoting resilience in families during COVID. And you heard about a little bit about um, sort of, you know, a lived experience of this. 
So I'm gonna go at a fairly quick, good clip because I wanna get through it all and then by three o'clock and then hopefully have lots of time for people who are able to stay to ask questions. All right, so let's get started. And there we go, I have nothing to disclose. And here's what I'm hoping we're gonna to learn today. At the end of this talk, people should be able to know something about the prevalence of children's emotional and behavioral problems to cope prior to COVID-19, appreciate the impact of COVID-19 on children's well-being, and become familiar with how to promote resiliency. So I, I'm gonna take you on a little bit of a journey, a little bit of a roller coaster, all right? So first I'm gonna bring you down and you're gonna see some stuff and you're gonna feel maybe a little down and a bit depressed as you listen to this, but I promise you I'm not gonna leave you there. I'm gonna bring you back up as we think about real things that we need to do and how can we learn and grow from this um, kind of collective trauma that we are all have experienced and, and continue to experience. So let's start with where, where did we start? What did life look like in the United States prior to the initiation of the pandemic? This is all pre-pandemic. For some people, this may be review, but about 13 to 20% of children in the United States, children and youth have a behavior and developmental concern at any given time. And roughly 37 to 39% of children will have a behavior or emotional disorder diagnosed by 16 years of age. Take that in, 37 to 39% of children. And it is young children also. One in six children um, ages two to eight will have a mental behavior or emotional disorder um, diagnosed in the early years. In a recent study that looked at the prevalence of developmental and behavioral disorders, approximately 9.5% of children were found to have ADHD, 7.1% anxiety, 7.4% of behavioral problem, and 2.5% of children diagnosed with AS, uh, autism spectrum disorder or ASD. And then when we look at some of the most significant, significant and severe consequences, we now know that suicide is the second leading cause of death among US children ages 15 to 24, and there has been a steep rise, a steep rise in suicide rates, 41% increase in suicide rates among US youth and young adults ages 15 to 24 between 2000 and 20, 2017. Let us just pause for a moment and think about this, the well-being of the children of the United States. We have to take in that in many ways, Something is not go was not even before the pandemic was not going great for children in the United States with prevalence rates like this, with severe rates of suicide, et cetera. So there is something about that the children of our nation are hurting, or there is something about the way we are diagnosing or the expectations that we are placing on children. So when we look at things like social determinants of health, what we know is that more than 10 million children in this country live in poverty with half in extreme poverty, meaning that they, there is an annual income for a family of four less than $13,000 a year. And in fact, this disproportionately affects children of color, where 71% of children in this nation living in poverty are children of color one in four black children and one in five Hispanic and Native American children. Prior to the pandemic, 1.5 million children experienced homelessness and more than one in seven children experienced food insecurity with nearly 50% of all public school students relying on reduced or free, reduced price or free meals. And that became very much in focus when the school shut down and all of a sudden we realized that there were children going hungry in this nation. So that was something important for us to learn. So in the backdrop of this, let's look at what happened over the course of COVID-19 on children's mental health and well-being. So the first thing we have to grapple with is just the issues of loss, of trauma and loss to children around the world and in this country. So what kind of losses are children facing? There was some modeling studies that were done that looked globally, now this is this in the world, between March 2020 and April 2021 and that were just recently updated. And what they found was that more than 5.2 million children around the world have experienced the death 
of primary caregivers, including at least one parent or custodial grandparent. There is so much noise, and you'll see on the next few slides, I'm gonna just give you some of these law statistics. There's so much noise, and especially in our country, political upset and sort of turning um, you know, COVID into a political football that we, that it drowns out sometimes the noise of that drowns out this real fact that there are so there are millions of children who have experienced the loss of a caregiver. And what's notable, and I'll show you on the next slide, because I think it's an interesting visual, is that the numbers of loss doubled in six months compared with the numbers in the first 14 months. There was this very steep increase. You know, and it's interesting when I gave this talk a number of months ago, that number was at 1.1 million and it is now more than 5.2 million. So this just shows you that if you look at where that dotted line is, this is what the losses look like in the first 14 months. And then there's just been this incredibly steep increase um, in the last six months. So that story continues to be to unfold. Well, what about in the United States? What, what, what is the um, loss situation looking like in the U.S.? So what we know is that more than 200,000 children in the United States have had a parent or caregiver die from COVID-19. And Chuck Nelson sort of um, coined this phrase called COVID orphans. And what we know is that for every four COVID deaths between April 20th and June 2021, one child lost a parent or caregiver. And there's this kind of ripple effect that's essentially what's been seen is that for every human being that dies, there tend to be about nine people who are bereaved as a result. So there's this sort of rippling out when we look at the toll of COVID-19. It is important to keep in mind that these losses are disproportionately affecting children of color. So look at these numbers. One in 168 Native American or Alaska Native children have lost a parent or a primary caregiver. One in 310 Black children, one in 412 Hispanic children compared with one in 753 white children. These numbers of um, losses are about 18 to 20% higher than what you would see in any other given year. The other kind of loss that we need to think about is learning loss. I think, Allison, you sort of talked a lot about or really brought to life the issue about sort of loss of services and learning loss. But what we know is that 1.1 to 3 million children never enrolled in school, showed up or logged in during the pandemic. 25 million. This is the number of students who were physically out of school for 13 months beginning in March of 2020. So what we know is that this huge number of children, of course, there's going to be people who are very differentially Affected. I mean, we know, for instance, and I thought just we'll come back to the story of Allison and to the Platts and to Noah is, you know, this is a your family, um, Allison, was so in many ways personally resourced. You had strengths, you had a lot of things that were able to sort of help to mitigate some of the um, learning loss. And that, but contrast that with there are many other families who don't have reliable internet access and are do not have parents or families who are able to be as present. And so there's a lot of variability in sort of what the outcomes are for this 25 million uh, students. Let me walk you through this slide. So this slide sort of compared the learning in the 20, in 2019, 2020 year across different grades and across different subjects contrasted with sort of historical average match scores over the previous three years. So just orient yourself to that line. It's kind of light in this, but the line that says 100. So that's the sort of where the average of what kids were doing over the past, say, three years prior to this 2019 and 2020 year. And you can see there is so much learning loss, but there's a few points I want you to notice, and one major one. If you look at the dots, the blue dots, those are sort of how kids were performing in schools where there are more than 50% students, white students. There is plenty of learning loss there that is quite sobering, but look at the dots also with um, the black dots. These are schools where there were more than 50% students of color attending those schools. And what you can see is that in every single metric that was measured, there is a distinction between schools with predominantly white students and schools with predominantly students of color. So we know again and again, you're gonna see in this talk, that there is a disproportionate affecting of the, of the impact of COVID-19 
on um, children of color and, and their families. Now we need to talk a little bit about mental health. I told you, I'm gonna bring you down. You'll see, we're gonna get somewhere. We're gonna to try to figure out what on earth are we gonna do with all of this? There was a very good meta-analysis that was done that looked at the prevalence of anxiety and depression between um, January, 2020 and March, 8, 2021. So, you know, these numbers are still need to be updated. But what they did in this meta-analysis, sort of going through all of these articles and then combining the subjects so that they ended up having a very large subject number of over 80,000 participants. And this is what they found, that one in five children globally were experiencing anxiety, um, were experiencing clinically significant anxiety, and one in four children globally were experiencing clinically significant um, uh, depression. And these numbers are significantly higher than what we had seen pre-pandemic. So again, what we saw and what anyone who is in the business at all of caring for children knows is that, that children have really suffered very significant mental health issues. I'm gonna show you a few more slides um, on, the next, on the next couple of slides. But it's interesting because when you talk to, for instance, a lot of primary care pediatricians, they were kind of braced for the idea that there were going to be children with a lot of COVID-related um, physical illness. And in fact, this mental health sort of storm has caught people a little bit by surprise. Maybe it should have, maybe it shouldn't have, but it definitely did. This is a little bit of a complicated slide, so I'm going to walk you through it and see and show you a couple of key points. This slide looks at the number of ED visits for mental health and suicide attempts, and we see two. There are two um, uh, graphs. The top are girls, the bottom are boys, and there are three lines. So the kind of fine dotted line is 2019, the dashed line is 2020, and the solid line is 2021. And here are the key take-home points for this slide. When you compare with the rate in 2019, there was a 31% increase in the proportion of mental health related emergency department visits that occurred among adolescents ages 12 to 17 years in 2020. And during the winter of 2021, if you can see that line, um, the solid line on the top graph, ED visits for suspected suicide attempts were 50.6% higher among females compared with the same period in 2019. So there was sort of a little bit of a perfect storm happening here. Number one, kids were so much more symptomatic, but number two, many of the supports that had been in place, such as things like school-based mental health clinics and even in-person mental health visits, were gone. And so you had more ch children who were symptomatic with far less supports in place. And so what you saw were kids coming into the ED with very, very significant mental health problems. And this is continuing to this day. There is the emergency departments around this nation are clogged with children, just lined with children who are awaiting psychiatric bed placement. Same goes for inpatient borders where there are so many children who are waiting for placement because there are not enough psychiatric beds. And in this one, in this slide, this shows there was a survey that was done of parents um, about sort of some of the negative symptoms that their children had experienced. Things like difficulty concentrating on schoolwork, nervousness, trouble falling asleep, poor appetite or overeating, frequent headaches or stomach aches. And what I want you to notice is that 42% of parents endorsed at least one significant negative symptom that their child had experienced since the pandemic. And this number, when they looked at Hispanic families was significantly higher than that. So again, it tells us the children of our nation have experienced learning loss, loss of caregivers, mental health issues. And we know that in fact, that children with disabilities have had a significant impact this was a small study, but I think an interesting and meaningful one, looking at the impact of COVID on youth with ASD. And you know, I think we'll just continue to see more and more information emerge. So they looked at 239 children around a diff number of different outcomes, sleep, nutrition, challenging behaviors, communicative be abilities, and stereotype behaviors. And you can see that actually, there's three bars, the darkest one, no change, the middle gray, worsening, and then some um, the, the light gray improvement. 
And there's a lot of variability. But what you can see is that there's a number of areas where there's really very significant changes um, in functioning around sleep, around challenging behaviors, around stereotypical behaviors, which is interesting, Allison, because you were sort of talking about some of the perseverative behaviors in NOAA. And I think that this was seen in many kids with autism who are often just did very poorly when their routines were changed. And there was no predictability to, and so much uncertainty about what their days were going to look like. Okay. So these were the headlines that we, we've been seeing. And this is officials warn children's mental health worsens amid the pandemic. The American Academy of Pediatric, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and the Children's Hospital Association all of these national organizations have come together to declare a state of emergency on mental health. And as I told you before, children with psychiatric needs are overwhelming hospital emergency departments. So these headlines are in the news daily. Um, there is some maybe optimistic things without going into too much detail here. Um, there's been some bills by Ron Wyden that have been um, proposed to actually have a bipartisan mental health package by this summer and God willing, it'll be one of the only bipartisan things maybe that this country can seem to get done, but this would be an incredibly important one. Okay, so where do we go from here? It's pretty depressing, isn't it? I told you I was gonna take you on a little journey, a little go down and then try to go back up because we need to be thinking about like what on God's earth are we gonna do with this? Um, we started off on shaky territory and we are seeing the impact of that in so many different ways. So where do we go from here? Well, the first thing I think we all have to acknowledge is our COVID fatigue. We've all heard about this, but you know, it's been a long two years. We are tired. We are worn out. We have our personal, our professional resources have been stretched to the max. It is tough. We just want this to be sort of in our rear view mirrors. And it's hard to sometimes find the energy to figure out how on earth can we possibly be helpful. For those of us who are in healthcare, it has been a very challenging time for clinicians. We are somehow in the midst of a very anti-science movement and there's been a lot of targeting of people, of clinicians. And so, gosh, a lot of us are just feel a little bit like enough already. But I would say to you, there has truly never been a more important time to be in the business of caring for children because there has never, at least in my recent recollection, been a time where there needed to be a stronger voice on behalf of children um, in this nation to ensure that some of what has happened through this huge collective trauma does not go unaddressed. So we got to figure out now, what are we going to do about that? It made me think of this movie Groundhog's Day. Now, I don't know if all of you have seen this, and I'm sure I'm dating myself because it's a really old movie, but it's a great movie. And Groundhog Day was this movie where Bill Murray was in it. And he plays this very kind of disgruntled weatherman, very cynical and such. And he finds he's going down to Pennsylvania for Groundhog's Day, and he finds himself sort of caught in in the same day, and it's just repeating over and over again. And it felt a little bit like that's what COVID has like, been like for these last few years, just the same thing over and over again. But this movie, um, what was so remarkable, or I think so lovely about this movie is that through sort of this kind of trauma and daily kind of repetition, he started to kind of see things differently and he started to imagine things a little bit differently. And he started to be a little more bold in the way that he thought about things and took some risks and tried different things and reimagined himself and the world. And that is ultimately what ended up sort of helping him move on. And that's what I think we need to think about is how are we going to use this experience to kind of reimagine things a bit. Winston Churchill said, never let a good crisis go to waste, a great expression. And the truth of the matter is, again, if we don't really use this experience to think about, to learn from it and to be bold and imaginative in our thinking and to think about things in a bit of a different way, it is gonna be hard for us to heal and to move on from there. 
So what I would like to propose is that we need to use this, that we need to use this COVID experience as an opportunity to promote resilience and adaptation amongst children and families. And I would like to say that I think that any of us, um, and it's not necessarily all of us on this call, but that any of us who have experienced kind of COVID from a slightly, a place of some kind of comfort and protection, if you will, we've all experienced it over the last few years, but some of us, you know, have had the, the, the good fortune to make sure to have had food on our tables every day, a roof over our head, jobs and income and some stability, you know, that in many of us maybe have a little bit more bandwidth to be able to think about this. And it is a bit, I think, of our hopefully collective responsibility to do that. So let's talk about resilience and adaptation. We often spend a lot of time looking at the cracks in the sidewalk. We do need to do that. I don't, I'm not saying we shouldn't. I don't want people to walk away thinking that we shouldn't be looking at adversity and looking at you know, where there is trauma and adversity and identifying the deficits. But we do that all the time. What I would like us to think about is how are we gonna do, promote resilience and growth and recovery? So the first thing we have to do is actually define what do we mean by resilience? And in fact, many different areas have looked at resilience. So things like looking at individual resilience, family resilience, resilience after war, but also in other sciences like architectural and structural design, in climate, in engineering, they all come up with the same basic definitions. Resilience ultimately, is the strength to withstand a given level of stress without a loss of function. I'm gonna show you that um, a sort of, if you will, on the neurobiological side in a few slides, but it's the strength to withstand a given level of stress without a loss of function, the capacity to adapt to adversity, stressful life events, significant threats or trauma, and the ability to recover from disruptions in a reasonable time frame. So the amazing thing about human beings is that human beings have a remarkable ability for adaptation. You know, I always say, you watch those National Geographic movies, you see some animal bored out in the wild, you know, within five minutes, they're like running along the savanna. And then you look at human babies who are very helpless for in many ways, the first year or more of their lives. And you think, how is that possibly an advantage? The advantage is that we have a remarkable capacity for adaptation and we can cultivate that in people. And you're gonna see, I'm gonna say that over and over again. So I'm gonna tell you a really short, hopefully not too silly of a story, but the story, a story to, to illustrate resilience. So a number of years ago, my husband and I were given this beautiful cactus, very tall, erect, very regal, lovely cactus needed very minimal care perfect plan for me and you know I just loved and enjoyed looking at this cactus and one day I come downstairs and the whole beautiful red cactus is kind of flopped over and my husband's like oh just throw it away it's dead I was like no 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 we've got to save this cactus so I kind of cut it I don't know what I replanted it I got off what I thought was maybe the dead parts and then I just sort of watered it for honestly a good solid year and I'm, I really think I, I for a long time I thought I was just watering a dead plant and then all of a sudden it came to life and it just grew from every direction every ending just there was a remarkable explosion of growth that's what my cactus looked like today it is not the regal and tall cactus that it once was it was changed from this event I don't know what caused it, it was changed, but it is thriving, it is alive. You could say, do you think it's more beautiful? Is it less beautiful? And I would tell you that is not the important question. It is just what it is, but it has gone through what was a significant event and it is now thriving. When we look at resilience, this picture kind of shows us what I would call sort of, if you will, early resilience science. Early resilience science noticed that there were people, kids, families, who in the midst of significant adversity somehow seemed to do well. And they stood out above amongst others because they did well when so many others within those same similar settings experiencing the same level of adversity, you know, were not thriving. And so it got people thinking about, well, what was it about these folks that they were doing so well? 
And then the next generation of, of Brazilian science started to look at, you know, how can we replicate? What were those things that we maybe hypothesized were the factors that, you know, promoted resilience in these individuals? So it's really, really important work, but I want to make sure we understand a few things. The only, the downsides of this are the following, and there are two. Number one is that it leads us to think that resilience is this kind of static trait, a static trait within a person. Either you are resilient or you are not. Now, we all do have certain genetics and adaptive capacities, but the notion that resilience is a static thing that either is, is there or isn't is not correct. And in fact, what you're going to see is we can cultivate resilience in people. And so we, should, we, don't want to, we don't want to look at it that way. The second thing that I think is also sometimes a really dangerous way that this kind of resilience science is misused is to look at folks who have done well and then expect everybody else to rise to that standard. Meaning that when they don't, that we sort of use a more blaming mentality. Well, look at see, that person did so well, why can't you? And I think that's a really something we should be paying attention to. And when we hear it being used, we need to make sure we shut that down. This is what resilient science is sort of looking at now, sort of this multi-level interconnected systems of resilience that sort of move out from the individual, the family, the community, the culture and society. And people talk about developmental cascades. The idea that when a society is doing well, it will filter through culture, community, family, and to the individual level, and then again, outward in the other direction. Again, when individuals do well, that can influence families, communities, cultures, and societies. And I think this is the model we need to think about, especially in this era of COVID, where we have had a huge societal trauma um, an impact. And so we need to think about these developmental cascades and thinking about how can we make impact at each and every one of these levels, understanding that there is this flow between different systems and interconnectedness. There are different kinds of factors when we think about resilience. There are promotive factors. These are kind of those big blanket interventions we can do where there will be better outcomes for people and children and families across any level of risk. Then there's those more targeted factors, the protective factors that are specifically applied in the context of high adversity. And the one that in, for those of us who are all in the pediatric world that we often talk about are things that are around parenting interventions. So there are certain things that we can provide to families to help them be the best parents they can be. Any parent who receives them across any level of risk will benefit. But then children who are experiencing significant adversity some of these parents may need more targeted interventions. So different kinds of things that we do can function both in a promotive or in a protective way. All right, this is a complicated slide, but it's a really important one. So I wanna spend a few minutes on this. And this work comes out of the labs and the work of Steve Southwick and Dennis Charney, who have done a lot of work at looking at the neurobiological impact of interventions to promote resilience. So I'm gonna walk us through it a little bit take home a few key principles. Just doing a little time check. Yep, we're doing great. All right, so, um, okay. So starting off at your bottom left, we all know everybody has a set of genes that they are born with and you got, everybody has ones that tend to function in some ways that probably are protective and others that put us at risk. We often look at the neurobiological effects of adversity on brain development. But it is important on the flip side to look at the preventive and therapeutic interventions and look at, again, the neurobiologic effect on, um, on resilience. So that's up here in our orange box. And those interventions can exert their effect in a number of different ways. Through the environment, changing family and community support and resources, directly on neurocircuitry and on psychological factors such as feelings of self-efficacy, optimism, positive emotion, and cognitive reappraisal. Cognitive reappraisal being the ability to kind of reevaluate situations that are very stressful or emotionally, you know, eliciting things in a less threatening way. So that ability to pause, reevaluate, reconsider. 
When we look at the genes and those preventive interventions, they often operate on neural circuitry through epigenetics and gene expression, and again, through those psychological factors. And let us understand what are the changes that can happen at the neurobiological level? What are the actual changes to brain circuitry? I think this is very exciting because it tells us that the work we do can actually make structural differences in brain development in children and in families. So this is a balanced threat reward responses, better emotional regulation, more cognitive control. And again, it's that notion of being able to sort of appraise situations more accurately, to more accurately look at a stress response, really estimate is this a true threat or not, and then having good stress response systems that are adaptable and that have an efficient recovery. I mean, you want to be able to respond to something that is a stress, but you want to be able to come back to homeostasis, back to control quickly and not stay in a state of seeing the world in a heightened um, you know, with a heightened stress level. These are the kinds of things that come together to promote resilience. And so many of the interventions that, um, that have been put in place really contribute to this. Things like having, again, parenting interventions, school-based mental health. I'm gonna show you another slide in a few, sort of listing out a bunch, but community support programs, integrated care and pediatrics, and there's many things, it's beyond the scope of this talk today, that have really looked at the impact on very specific areas of the brain when we put those interventions in place. All right, so let's get now a little bit more um, uh, concrete about what, what do we mean by resilience? All right, and that's what we'll spend the next part of our talk on. So Ann Maston from the University of Minnesota kind of this really neat work where she came up with sort of what she called the short list of common resilience factors. And what's really interesting about this is she looked across a lot of different areas of science that were looking at resilience. And these are systems and areas of science that were not in communication with each other. You know, again, looking at individual resilience, family resilience, resilience after trauma. And, and what she found was there was a remarkable kind of coming together and coherence amongst all these different lines of research, even though they had not really been in communication. She sort of said to herself, well, why is that? What is it about that? And it's really in many ways thought to be that these are sort of the fundamental human adaptive systems that have evolved over time and over generations of human biological and sociocultural evolution. In many ways, these are the ingredients that form the essence of what it means to be a well-functioning human. So I want you to look at these and think about how do we use these when we work with children and with families. Sensitive caregiving, connections and close relations, relationships, rituals, routines, and traditions, self-efficacy, problem solving and flexibility, self-regulation, motivation to succeed, optimism and hope, meaning and purpose, quality education, well-functioning communities. All of this, by the way, is suffused with sort of cultural and religious and spiritual um, beliefs. Let me just make two comments here before we, we, before we move on. Number one, this is hard work to often cultivate this in families. This is not, this is not the sort of gratuitous thing of saying, hey, think positively, or hey, keep up hope. That's kind of cheap stuff that quite honestly, in many ways, is so insulting to people who have experienced significant and serious um, traumas or effects of things like COVID. So it is not that kind of very superficial, like, hey, think, think positive thoughts. It is about truly think helping people reimagine, be bold in their thinking, cultivate the kinds of things in life that will contribute to resiliency. It's hard work and it's hard work to help. It's hard work for individuals and it's hard work to help people get there. I just want to make that point because I don't want people to walk away thinking that resiliency is just telling people, hang in there, it's going to get better. That is not resiliency. Steve Southwick and Dennis Charney also did this neat thing. They asked Navy SEALs, 
you know, who do all this risky stuff, they ask them, well, how do you do all that risky stuff that you do? And over and over and over again, they said, same answer, it's not just me, it's my squad. And what they realized from that was a few things that number one, something about people being reliant and dependent on each other promoted the ability to be courageous and to be brave and to take these kinds of risks. And what they found also was that a sense of that not just receiving support, but giving support was also very, um, was very important. I just got a sign that said my internet connection is unstable. So I hope if I lose connection, I will be back. So when we think about working with families, one thing we want to ask people is who's in your squad? Who gives you support? Who do you support? And Steve Southwick said when he sits with families or parents or adults that he's working with, it's the first thing he asks. Because if people have no support and there's no one that they can lean on or who leans on them, it is often the first place where he looks to help to build something like that. Where can you find a squad? Where are you going to find a squad if you don't have one? That is one of his first steps in helping people build resiliency. There are other ways too to promote resilience. Exercise, it has been shown to enhance cognition, stress regulation, hippocampal size. You gotta have safe places to play and you gotta make sure that people are actually able to find the time to get outside and use exercise. Meditation and mindfulness. Cultivating realistic optimism, not false optimism and not dire circumstances. So helping people recognize distorted predictions and creating opportunity from adversity. We often, as I said earlier, we look at the cracks. We often, those of us who are in the business of providing care, use have been trained often to use a deficit model. But I would suggest, and we often talk about using a strength-based approach. But I would say that we want to think about how are we going to do that? There are not a lot of great measures to use in, in settings that are quick and easy to use. But I hope you keep in mind some of those factors that I showed you, because very simple questions can be asked of people. Well, who is in your squad? What, do you, what kind of rituals are important in your family? How does spirituality help you from a, on a, does spirituality help you on a day-to-day -day basis? What motivates you to go on? And what we can find is that when people have some things, we can help them strengthen it. And if there's a dearth of it, we can help them figure out where are we gonna, where are we gonna help you find how to make meaning in life? These, I won't read them all, but these are some of the pediatric interventions that we know are used to promote resiliency. These are promotive interventions, protective interventions. I'll let you read them, but I will tell you that the most important thing we can do often in childhood is around parenting interventions to ensure that there are stable, rich relationships between parents and children, that parents are have the ability to move all those boulders out of the way so parents can be emotionally available to their children. All right, let me just do a little time check. I think we're good. I think we're gonna finish right on time. As we think about promoting resilience, it is important though that we individualize care and we level the playing field. Not everybody is built the same. And hopefully I've showed that to you, that in fact, it's a, such a complex interplay of many different factors that come together. But we need to keep that in mind as we think about the kind of interventions because it's not always a one size fits all model. So I'm gonna walk you through a few things. When we are thinking about COVID, we just have to think about, we have to dig a little deeper to know what matters in regards to COVID effects. What was functioning like before the pandemic? It doesn't mean we know what it's gonna look like during and after, but it gives us at least a little bit of a, something to think about. What, were you, what was a family dealing with? And the truth of the matter is that families who had so many you know, social determinants of health the likelihood that they were gonna, you know, not come out of COVID without having more burden is just, is very unlikely. How closely did the pandemic touch a family or a child? How long did the adversity last? Was it a short little blip or has it been going on and getting worse over the course of two years? What is the child's age or developmental level during COVID? You know, for young children who may not really understand all of the complexity of COVID, they do understand and are very vulnerable to separation and loss. Older children had, um, you know, have so much more involved with community and with peers that losing that has been 
really isolating and created a lot of loneliness and fear. And what is the family life cycle? Who's at home? Was it older kids, younger kids? This helps us to understand like sort of what is the level of risk that a family might be experiencing. And I briefly, and I'm gonna do this ultra quick, but just wanna point out this differential susceptibility hypothesis. You know, I put this up here and I talk about this all the time. People may have heard about the dandelion and the orchid. Um, that came out of the work, a lot of Tom Boyce's work. So dandelion, a lot of people think of dandelions as weeds. I like to call them flowers now because I have a lot of respect for dandelions. They grow everywhere. They grow in the cracks. You look, you know, you walk down a city street and there they are popping out. They're resilient little flowers, aren't they? They just, you know, even in the midst of very low resources, they do, they grow. The orchids, on the other hand, you know, need a lot of tender, loving care. I have I have killed many an orchid in my time, but they, um, you know, give them the wrong care, they wither. Give them the right care, the right environment, and they flourish and they're beautiful and stunning. So what we know is there are kids who are dandelions, there are kids who are orchids. They all need some basic similar levels of, of care and sort of a basic, you know, kind of care. But then we need to think about who actually needs what. And what we do know is that there are genetic variants that seem to confer greater vulnerability to environmental stimuli, especially around the dopamine and serotonin transporter genes. So we have to kind of keep that in mind. And again, when we think about resilience, some of these kids, again, who may have been able to, to thrive in the midst of adversity may have been more of these sort of, if we will, dandelion types of kids. Who are the vulnerable? Well, the people on this call, I think know very, very well who the vulnerable are our English language learners, children with disabilities, children living in poverty, homeless children, children of color, and children in juvenile justice or foster care. It is so important that we do not take our focus off of, our, of this population of children who are so at risk for some really long-term negative consequences of COVID. And then we need to think about disparities slide is already um, a bit old, but it tells the story. So when we looked at COVID deaths among older adults by race and ethnicity, this is from January 20 to January 21, if overall there were 631 deaths per 100,000, what you can see is that for white people and for Asian, it was below, the numbers were below. But if you look at Black, Hispanic, Native American, and Alaskan, you can see that these numbers are significantly higher. So what we know is that there are um, COVID disparities, that children of color are at higher risk for trauma and loss, PTSD, a disproportionate impact on food, financial and housing security, educational loss and poor school readiness. If we don't think about this now, right now, and we don't do something about this right now, and then in five to 10 years, when that gap has widened, are we gonna remember that this was the origin? And what I would say is shame on us for missing that opportunity. And lastly, what I would say for those of us who provide care, this is an important opportunity for us to rethink how we deliver care. For those of us who are on this call who are in, in you know, potentially medical providers, mental health providers, other kinds of providers, you know, what I learned from COVID is we need to think boldly. We need to imagine differently because we need to promote resilience in the way we do things. And I just want to highlight that we use telehealth to reach hard to reach families. And it is an incredible modality. So we need to consider and continue to think about innovative ways to evaluate and treat children and challenge, challenge our beliefs, things that we hold so dear and challenge them. Is that really true? We need to demand that payment continues for telehealth and insist that it is not used as a cost-cutting measure, sort of to give lesser care, but better care. Okay, so I finished by telling you, again, this slide, never let a good crisis go to waste. So this was not the first disaster to strike human beings, and unfortunately, it will not be the last. So we need to find ways to plan, to identify gaps, to look at what did we learn from all this? You know, when the schools closed, if you didn't have internet access, you couldn't learn. When schools closed, kids went hungry. We found that our healthcare systems, our mental health systems, our school systems lacked flexibility to pivot quickly. 
We learned and are continuing to learn about the intense effect of uncertainty, isolation, loss, and fear on our youth. But we also learned how very interdependent we all are on each other to function at our best. So I conclude by saying that many metrics of child well-being weren't great before the pandemic. The pandemic increased risk and vulnerability of children and families. While we are tired, frustrated, and worn out, we have an opportunity to promote resilience, individualize care, and innovate and be bold in our thinking and use our voices in important ways and understand that the imprint of COVID-19 will be felt for a very long time. I thank you all for your attention. I think I just made it to three o'clock and I will stop sharing for now. It is exactly three o'clock. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, so we know some people have to leave. So we invite you to stay for a time of question and answer. I would ask that you put your questions in the Q&A. If you'll click the Q&A button, there was um, a lot going on in the chat during the presentation and it's hard to go back to certain questions. So if you will put them in the q and A, I I will read them out to Dr. Weitzman. I know there's some, there's some stuff going on in chat right now. So continue to talk in chat. You're welcome to discuss it there. But if you want me to read something aloud, um, if you'll put it in the Q&A. OK, so uh, this first one feels a little tricky. I'm going to let you answer however you choose, All right, uh, Dr. Weitzman. Um, what are your thoughts on the COVID mitigation measures used to prevent or reduce the spread? I'm, here's how I'm going to just tackle that. I'm not. I just, I'm going to not because I just feel like there are people who are, that are just so much more knowledgeable and so much more informed to address that. So I'm going to just, I'm just going to tell you I'm ducking that question because I, I don't think that's, I, they're, they're experts. There are people who spend their entire days thinking about these things. But what I would just say, I'll sorry, I'll just chime in on this. I, I think it is extraordinarily unfortunate the amount of political divisiveness that has arisen as a uh, around COVID. And I guess what I would say is to the people on this call, our job is to make sure we keep the focus on for where it needs to be on the well-being of children and families. Thank you so much for your answer. Um, were kids with disabilities included in this study, including disabilities in study is vital. I think that's in reference to the chart that you showed um, about the loss of school towards the beginning of your, if anybody wants to clarify, I can come back to that question or if you know off the top of your head. I'm not, I'm not totally sure what we're referring okay. to and I'm not sure I know the answer either, okay. so. Great. Are there some specific? So far, I'm zero for two. Okay, keep going. Let's see Those were two get... tough ones to get you started, just to get you warmed up. Are there some specific programs or practices you can highlight addressing disparities and promoting resiliency? Innovations happening in communities, care settings, state levels, et cetera. You know what? I'm going to be like, not, uh, this group who I think, I know people have, some people have to leave, but I am going to ask folks on this call who are doing this work, I'll give you a few things, but put stuff in the chat. Tell us what you know of what's going on. I mean, I can tell you about some of the things that I think of in, in the world that I live in, but for people who are aware of this, put it in the chat. I think it would be super helpful for all of us to see it. Number one is I would say things like having school-based mental health programs. Not all states have them. They're not well-funded enough. And I think having a really robust amount of school-based mental health is an incredibly important way to promote resilience. And the other one that I was thinking about were things like, um, you know, having integrated behavioral health within pediatric settings so that people can come to see their pediatric provider and that there's not this big step off between their a recognition of a mental health problem and getting um, supports and services, but that supports can be provided right then and there. The other thing I would say is there's a lot of things on the educational level that you know schools have talked about in terms of promoting more intensive tutoring, small group things to sort of make sure that kids who have had a lot of learning loss are being brought up to speed and being brought up back up to grade level. 
all around that wrap around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, put stuff in the chat. I think we'd all benefit. We can also unmute if somebody wants to raise their hand. If somebody has a comment that they would like to make out loud, we can. I think we can do that. Um, are there data collected during the pandemic with youth who live in residential settings, treatment centers, correctional facilities, and other congregate care settings? I don't know. These are hard questions, you guys. <laughs> I don't know. God, I sure hope so. I haven't seen literature about that, but I, but I surely do hope so. I'm just reading some of the comments. You know, I'd like to make a comment, by the way. I know it, it sort of is something, of, somebody put something in about masking and, you know, in the beginning of the pandemic, there was a sense that number one, children with disabilities would not comply with mask mandates. And I, I'm curious what other people found. I did not really find ultimately that to be true. Number two is I also think, especially for some of our kids with disabilities who are very routine driven, who have had a lot of anxiety, helping them ultimately, hopefully, fade the use of masks is going to be an issue. Many kids are incredibly nervous about that issue too. So I think we need to be as thoughtful about putting in mask mandates as when we start to ease these kinds of things that so many children, those with disabilities and those without, have a huge amount of anxiety around now um, the fear of what that means to take that mask off. Yeah, able accounts, yeah. I don't have any other questions in front of me. Does anybody else have? Oh, there is a hand up. Let oh, me... great. And Brandon is on that. I will say to the mask that my son is in the sixth grade and he is a child with ADHD and he has not had a, a mask problem, although I worried about it in the beginning. Um, and I do have some anxiety about the masks coming off. So I understand exactly where you're coming from. I haven't heard a lot of talk around that, but I think there is some anxiety um, about masks coming off. Yeah. What that will look like. It's just about being, I think it's about number one, being thoughtful and sensitive when we put things in place, when we take things away and understanding that children who both neurotypical and, and children, you know, children with disability and differences that we have to sort of think about each and every child and understand what are the impact of these kinds of um, decisions and individualized care. There, there's a real rush. There's a real rush to be like, yeah, we're done with it. We're done with it. You know, yeah, whatever. Take. And I think it's, a, these are the kinds of things that, as I said earlier, I think is a mistake. And I think, you know, people just being, yeah, it's over. Like, yeah, just go on. It's great. Be, think positive thoughts. These are the kinds of things that I think, again, don't, don't, don't at all think that's what I mean by resilience. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, great. These are nice comments. Okay, well, we've given time. Uh, we have sent, we shared the link. We will share the presentation. We will share the live, or we will share the recording of the live presentation and we will send out an evaluation. But if there's nothing else, we'll go ahead and say thank you very much for your presentation today, Dr. Weissman. We really appreciate it. And we will close out the webinar. Thank you everyone for your time. You are valuable to us. We appreciate your being here and we look forward to meeting with you in the future. Thank you so much and thank you for having me.